Uh, Eric Blake. Hi, Eric. Greetings, Bill Whittle, Vectron of the Aurora Star Republic. Hail, hail, hail Vectron. Um, do you have a secret talent you've never made public? If so, number one, what is it? Two, show us proof or it didn't happen. Ha ha. Um, I will... I will do the first part. I'm not going to do the second part. I might have done it once or twice before, um, but I'm not doing it now. All my life, I've, um, I've well, up until, let's say, two, three years ago, I've always just completely believed myself to be tone-deaf, tin-eared, musically incompetent, absolutely cannot play any musical instruments whatsoever, nothing. And then I was... Um, I was just humming along on the radio with somebody who was an actual voice instructor in the car. And uh, she turned on the sound and she said, G can you give me that back again? And I hummed it again. How about this other song? I hummed that again. And she said, you have perfect pitch. So what is I I've heard the term before, but I didn't really know what it meant. I thought it meant that you could sing a perfect note and keep it. He sa she said... Um, you, you can reproduce the tones perfectly because you hear a clear distinction between the tones. And that really changed uh, a lot for me. So actually there are times when I actually uh, sing a little bit. As a matter of fact, uh, I've been spending a fair amount of time with Evan Sayet lately, uh, the four of us, me, Natasha, Evan, and Evan's ego. Uh, and we... Um, and and it, and his wonderful partner Karen, uh, and Evan started singing. We'd had a a couple of drinks by this point. Um, he started singing and the right stuff, you know, all the oldies and the not oldies, oldies, but just pop culture stuff from when we were younger. And I just joined in, and and I, I mean, you have to ask Natasha about this. I'm certainly a better singer than I thought I was, and I'm a better singer than I used to be. And there is one song, which is um, Come Fly With Me, which I've practiced probably a hundred times in the car. And having rehearsed that, having never rehearsed anything else, but having really put effort into getting that one song right, I can sing that song pretty well. And the reason I'm not going to do it now is because uh, I require a small bit of lubrication in order to get that to, to happen. Um, so, so yes, my secret uh, talent is that I, I can sing a bit and also... Um, I can play drums, and uh, that surprised me too. Uh, playing drums is like the closest thing I've ever experienced to playing drums, and I think I had to do it first. Um, I'm sorry, Bone Canoe says, if somebody plays a note on the piano, can I tell you what note it is? I cannot. So maybe I have relative pitch, whatever it is. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't do that. But in any event, I, um, I can remember songs with a great degree and repeat them with a great degree of tonal accuracy. So, no, I'm not one of those people where you're going, ding, ding, that's C-sharp. No, that's not me at all. I don't mean to claim that. So maybe that's not the term I'm looking for. Anyway, um, back to um, uh, what that was I talking about. Um, oh, drums. Um, the closest thing I've, that I ever had to playing drums, and I think the drums came first, um, was... Uh, flying a helicopter. Um, if any of you out there are helicopter pilots, as well as fixed-wing pilots, the dirty secret about a fixed-wing airplane is you, if you take your hand off the stick, it'll fly better probably than you're flying it. An airplane is inherently stable and will fly very, very well on its own as long as you've got it trimmed up uh, without an autopilot. I mean, they're just stable and they'll go where they're pointed and they just fly all day. You can just completely relax and do what you need to do. But a helicopter, you're flying 24 hours a, a day all the time, uh, and hovering especially, because you can make a, you know, a hundred foot altitude error when you're at six thousand feet, but when you're at five feet, that hundred altitude error can cost you dear. So when I was learning to fly helicopters, it was impossible, in the same way that riding a bike is impossible, until suddenly it wasn't. And I, I can't tell you that I was, it wasn't one of these things like, oh, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, I'm getting, no, I couldn't do it, and then suddenly I could. And that's how I remember learning how to ride the bike, and that's how I remember learning how to play the drums. And the problem with the drums is, um, first of all, you need a good sense of rhythm, which I apparently have. 
uh, as a matter of fact, just as a, since you asked, uh, I've often toyed with the idea of um, of starting the Michael, Bu Michael Buble version of Come Fly With Me in another room and recording me singing it a cappella from memory and see how close they are on the timing. That would be interesting to me. I get the feeling I'd probably do a, a three minute, four minute song. I'd probably be within a second or two would be my guess. Might be wrong about that. Anyway, um, yeah, it turns out I have a sense of rhythm and, uh, and so when you're learning how to play the drums, you have to you have to take out what has always been coordinated motion between your hands and your feet, and you have to break them all into individual components. Um, it's difficult until you practice to make your left foot tap to a different rhythm than your right foot. And it's difficult to make your left hand and your right hand do things that are, you know, completely different. And to have them all four going at the same time is impossible, and then it's not. So I also play drums badly, and by the way, I played only, only played with uh, live musicians um, two or three times. This place called Gunner's Garage in Gainesville is a mechanic, and he liked to work all night, and he had a loft in his, um, you know, five-car industrial garage, and up in the loft there was a drum set and a couple guitars, and people just come over, and he'd just stop working on cars, and he'd basically go up and play for half an hour, and then come back work on his cars again. His job as a mechanic. And I was up there, and somebody had a second drum set or something, and I was there with my friend Steve Stipp, who has always been a musical genius. And, um, and we were... I was playing drums, and this other guy was playing drums. And he was doing all of these fills. I don't know how to do any fills. I just never got that much instruction. Um, but I could hear us going out of rhythm. And I remember thinking, man, I am screwing this song up. And I talked to Steve about it afterwards, and he said... No, man, you were, you were spot on. It's this guy was, was, it's his count was off. You were, you were right on. You were rock solid. And, um, and that made me unbelievably pleased. Uh, so I don't play very good lead drums, and I don't have any um, skill or flourishes or anything like that but I can keep a beat. And one thing I've learned from being a very, very poor drummer who's only taken, you know, four or five lessons in his life is I've realized that a drummer can not only keep a beat, but a drummer can put the energy into the... The drummer can put the charge into that song. A, 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 a really switched-on drummer can put momentum and energy into the song just by the way he plays and and you can it's like driving the beat it's like you're pushing you're pushing the beat into this song and you're giving it um you're giving it energy and everybody knows it uh, a couple nights ago i was up in a wonderful place my probably my favorite place in la called a vibrato jazz club it's hidden away right up on the top of Mulholland drive and it's um, owned by um uh not sergio mendez um, Herb Alpert. Uh, it's wonderful. And um, we've listened to a number of jazz bands up there and a, and a, and a number of, um, of live musicians and, and so on. But I was in that room for 20 seconds and I said, this is the best drummer I've ever seen. Uh, I want to say his name was Matt Phillips. And he looked exactly like... Um, he looked exactly like Gene um, Krantz. He looked like a mission control director. He, he was wearing a buzz cut. He looked like an engineer from 1967. And the, the whole band was wearing skinny ties and everything. And this guy had the most practical level face. I mean, the guy just looked like looked like a, a, a like an electrician, electrical engineer. And I was in there for 20, 30 seconds and I said to, to Natasha, I said, this guy's unbelievable. There's, it's so crisp. It's like if, if all of the drum beats that people normally play, so beat, 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 and there's a little variation in time window, he doesn't have any. It's just, it's spot dead on. And it's just so crisp, I couldn't believe it. And, um, and then he did a drum solo, which is unbelievable. But, the, but drum solos are, are showing off. When you can hear that degree of, of crispness and um, precision, that's the word, P 
precision. Uh, I was just completely blown away, and I went up to him uh, between sets, and I just said, I just got to tell you, I, I, you're the best drummer I've ever heard, and it's immediately clear to me. And he was very, very nice about it. And he was awfully good. Okay, moving on. Uh